Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Welcome back, everyone, to Fighting on Film. We have another guest for you this week. We have for you today historical advisor extraordinaire Taff Gillingham, and he's going to be joining us as we talk about 2017's Journey's End. Welcome, Taff. Absolute treat to have you with us. I'm delighted to be asked. Thank you very much indeed. It's our pleasure. So, Matt, do you want to start by giving us a little rundown of the plot of Journey's End? Yeah, okay. So it's a rather well-known play, uh, written in 1928, I believe, by R.C. Sheriff. Um, and I think the film was adapted by Simon Reed, and it was directed by uh, Saul Dibb. Mm-hmm. And it basically, it it's the week before the, the big 1918 German Spring Offensive, and we follow um, the officers of a line company in, in the front line, uh, preparing a trench, knowing that an attack is imminent yeah and it's it's a it's a company that's been through the whole war and its officers are feeling the strain and the tensions ramp throughout the week and uh taff you were involved with the film as a consultant and also you provided the the uh, the, the costumes and the kit etc so we're really looking forward to discussing uh the film as a film but also getting a little bit of insight into the work that you do yeah, I mean, I think uh, I mean that's a that's a pretty good uh, pretty good summing up. I mean, I think that one of the problems with Journey's End is that we're all so familiar with it just because it's kind of been around forever. Mm. But I think it's probably worth just um, doing do, do something. I mean, something that um, really just sort of explains, as you said, my, my my role as historical advisor with the film. Uh, but I'd been involved with Journey's Ends um, really back since 2004. I mean, we, we'd set up Khaki Devil as a company to hire uniforms, equipment, weapons and props in 2001, towards the end of 2001, to uh, to supply The Trench, the, the, the BBC television series The Trench. And in 2004, we got to do our first major West End production, which was Journey's End. And um, <clears throat> we had a call out of the blue from a, a, from a lovely lady called Charlotte, who was the costume designer. Um, and she was working with Jonathan Fensom, who was the production designer. And they met us in a, in a pub in, in London, in, um, obviously in the West End. And, um, and we sat there and we went through the whole thing, what we could do for them, how, how we could sort of help bring it to life. And even though I, years ago, I'd, obviously I'd seen Journey's End I'd, I'd, uh, as a play, I'd, um, I, I'd read the book years and years before as well, but I went back and revisited it. And so we were able to, and I'm telling you all this because it does have a direct uh, sort of knock on to, to what happens with the film. Um, so I, I sort of worked the way through and, and I said that, it, you know, it, it's not specific who the unit are at any point in the book. Yeah. So we have to make them somebody. So I suggest that we make them the 9th Battalion, the East Surreys, because Sheriff himself had served as an officer in the 9th East Surreys during the war. He'd actually been wounded uh, d- during the Third Battle of Ypres and, um, and, and didn't return to France after that. And in fact, there's a, a cracking photograph which was taken earlier in 1917, uh, pretty certain it was April 1917, of him and the other officers of his company uh, all gathered together. There's a version of it with the helmets on and one with the with the caps on. Right. Um, and it's a fascinating picture because when you look at the photograph, um, you can see some of the, certainly some of the inspiration for the characters. There's a, a, a large jovial chap who, uh, who, who looks like he's probably trotter, but he's old enough to be uncle and he was probably a bit of both. You know, the, uh, the company commander who almost certainly was the, was the model for Stano, but I mean, you know, once upon a time I could have told you all of their names. But the, the point is that that Journey's End was pretty much drawn from life. It, it was drawn from his experience. So it made sense to make it the East Surreys. And he also made the point it wasn't an anti-war film or anti-war play in its original form. Uh, it was just literally a snapshot in time. Mm. And uh, so, so we decided that we would make them the Ninth East Surreys, which is why they got all of the um, all of the the, the the 24th Division 73 Brigade patches, which we put on the sleeves for, originally for the play, um, which again did get used in the film but because there was a need for the magic of film in the morning right and the 150 blokes are all going to be ninth east surreys and in the afternoon they're going to be the lot that they're relieving so we couldn't put them on the sleeves of all of the fellas 
but the officers, so the, the officer characters had them all. And of course, the, uh, the one of the most oft, often asked questions, you know, what's the little ribbon at the back of the collars? Yeah, yeah. Red, white and black uh, ribbon. Um, when the 9th East Surreys first went to France, all of the officers of the battalion had these little uh, V-shaped ribbons at the back of the collars. Um, but only those who'd landed in France originally, so all the ones that came later didn't get to wear them. It was a distinction for the old timers. So wow. the, the decision was that we would make Stanhope and Osborne as the two senior longest serving chaps mm. we would give them the the ribbons and the others wouldn't have them Th that decision that they were going to be ninth east Surrey's that dated right back to, to to me suggesting it for the West End production in 2004 and and that and that production in its own right was quite significant because um David Greenley the director um he said to me right from the start the, the crucial thing is that we are we are going to open on the same night at 75 years to the day later in the same theatre. It was originally the Savoy Theatre by 2004. It was called the Comedy Theatre in the West End. But we are going to open uh, exactly 75 years to the day with, with, the, with the sort of revival. Uh, it was a huge success. Um, uh, one of the lovely touches at the end, the screen comes down and it's all of the names. It was a shot from the Menning Gate. Uh, and I suggested to Jonathan Fenson they should sort of dot in, in the, on the East Surrey's panel, sort of add Stan Open, all the others in there. Um, mm. And it, it, huge success. Um, it then went on, it toured the, the UK. Uh, there was a Broadway production. Uh, so, darlings, we can say that we've worked on Broadway, uh, although we didn't get to go. Um, and um, it, I think it ended another tour a few years later. So yeah, we'd been very close to Journey's End. Mm. And then... <laughs> The, the, the next sort of link in the chain, the next link that got us to, to, to the film was the film of Private Peaceful, Michael Morpogo's book, Private Peaceful, uh, which uh, obviously was, I think, was screened in 2012, but I think we were probably making it in, um, I think, 2013. And that came about simply because we had a call out of the blue from Guy de Bojo, who was the producer, who was looking for uniforms. And uh, we said to him, OK, okay what do you want all these uniforms for? He said, oh, well, we're, we're making Private Peaceful. And uh, we said, so where are you going to make it? Oh, well, we're going to make it in Devon because that's where it's set. And they said, well, we've got some trenches. You should come and have a look at our trenches. And we, we managed to persuade them to come and have a look. And, um, and while they were here, um, we then sort of took them and showed them various other locations, said, well, this could be your village school and this could be the uh, headquarters and all sorts of other stuff. And basically, by the end of their visit, the director said, yeah, fantastic. We, we will shoot Private Peaceful here. And during that shoot, a guy and, uh, and Simon Reed, who, uh, who, who wrote Private Peaceful, the screenplay for Private Peaceful and also Journey's End, yeah. uh, they said to us, we're, we're, we're going to make Journey's End. We're desperate to make Journey's End. Um, but there were all sorts of problems. Um, the biggest one, which seemed at the time to be almost insurmountable, was the fact that Warner Brothers had owned the rights to the film for years and years and years. And... Um, so not unreasonably, we, we said, well, why don't you just ask them if you can buy them? They said, well, their company policy at Warner Brothers is that they will buy the rights to films and sit on them so nobody else can make them. Yeah. Even if they've got no intention of doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. So in the end, they got assistance from Prince Andrew, who wrote to Warner Brothers and you know, with, a, with, with, with his royal hat on and said, actually, is there any chance that this is very, very important film uh, at the time of the centenary of the First World War? It's very important. British story. Uh, it's one of the few stories of 1918, you know, as a piece of drama that's ready to go. And they, 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 they were persuaded to part with it. So we got the call in September, I think it was, in 2016. And the guy rang me up and said, uh, at long last, we're ready to go. So oh, that's, that's fantastic. You know, this was, well, let's say, September 2016. And Kevin and I are saying, oh, this is marvellous. You know, that will keep us busy next March or April and give us a bit of time to sort everything out. And I said, so, um, so when do you want to shoot it? Uh, November. So what, next November? No, 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 no. In about a month and a half's time, we want to start shooting it. There was then a, a frantic heap of activity because the, the trench system was looking a bit long in the tooth, you know, because, I mean, it's one of those things, where, however it's been at the end of a film shoot, that's how we'll leave it yeah. until the next production comes along because there's no guarantee that the next people won't want it how it has been. But no, no, we want it to be pretty much revamped, but obviously with a damage bit, to which was the bit they take over, which is how the French had had it, and it's all run down and dilapidated. Mm. So in the space of a month, literally, the, the, uh, the whole thing gets re-timbered. There's something like six or 7,000 sandbags have to be filled and laid, uh, and they have to be filled full of earth. You can have them delivered full of sand, but then when the sandbags rot, you end up with a, with a beach instead of a trench. So that was all done. It was all revamped. In the meantime, 
obviously uh, we're, we're sorting out uniforms, we're sorting out equipment, we're sorting out weapons, we're, we're recruiting 170 odd specialist extras, who, who, most of whom know what they're doing. And of course, uh, going through the script, because to me, the crucial thing with the historical advisor role is that the earlier you can see the script and be involved with the process throughout, which I think is a crucial thing, which a lot of films don't do. Yeah, that was something I was going to ask. Yeah, when you get involved with the script. To me, that that's absolutely key because you can cut off 99% of the errors that a film will end up with if, you, if you're in fairly early on, if you're in from the start. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so, so the art department aren't making the wrong signs, so the, mm. the costume department aren't choosing the wrong gear. All of those things can be can be dealt with quite early on. I mean, going all those years back to All the King's Men back in 1999, when we went and uh, filmed the story of the Fifth Norfolks at Gallipoli, mm. um, I turned up in, uh, at BBC in London uh, and walked into an office and the only person there was was the line producer and her, her, her PA, and that was it. And I said, where's everyone else? She said, there isn't anyone else. Why isn't anyone else? She said, because you're the most important person. As far as I'm concerned, we're working on a historical piece about the military and, and that's your role. You're, you're going to stop everyone else making the mistakes. That's exactly what you want to hear, isn't it, when you walk into an office? Yeah. And, and sadly, that doesn't happen that often. But, but luckily, mm. because we'd worked with Guy and Simon before and the guy's fluidity films, basically, right from the outset, you know, we, you know I was able to go through the script. Um, and, and generally speaking with the script, I mean, you're, you're talking about um, sort of errors in, uh, in detail, it's, it's errors in terminology, it's errors in drill, it's, it's saluting with no hats, it's saluting holding rifles, all the things which you can just say, no, don't do that, they would never do that. Mm. As long as you then say, this is what they would do instead, because there's not, nothing worse for <laughs> if, you're trying to, um, if you're trying to make a film, then you have a historical advisor who just tells you why you can't make your film. Uh, the, the deal is always that you, you're saying, OK, well, um, th th this is a real problem. You really shouldn't do that. But how about you shoot it this way right instead? Yeah, it's got to be constructive. G given the solution, not just the problem, walk off. Most people we've been lucky enough to work with take on board 90 percent of what I say. And it's always great. And I say, right, you absolutely can't do this because it's complete and utter nonsense. This you shouldn't really do. But I see why <laughs> you're doing it. This. Yeah. OK, it's wrong. But I get them, and I can't think of a better way to make your story work. So actually, you're going to have to stick with that. Most of that will, will muddle along quite well. And I think, to be honest, Journey's End, I think actually, I, th I think it pretty much hit the mark. Um, yeah. Script was, I mean, the only thing that, that, that bugged me and still bugged me really is the whole business of having a, a battalion commander who's clearly in his 60s and is meant to be a sort of a doddery old melch it type fool. He's yeah. good in the role, but it, it's not it's not ideal casting. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and Simon's argument was, well, that's the drama. I said, but, but that's the problem. It isn't really drama. It's just tired old cliche. The drama yeah. would be to do what actually happened in 1918. And I mean, just to get a clue of that, if you look at the, uh, the Commonwealth War Gross Commission, if you if you look at if, if you if you search for lieutenant colonels, battalion commanders, between the 20th of March and the 27th of March that week, there are 41 of them who get themselves killed. And they range between 25 years old and 48, but the majority are sort of 40, you know, 35, 40. What they aren't, they aren't old duffers. There's a couple of scenes uh, with with him where he's reluctant to be in the trench, you know, and he, he's visi visibly uncomfortable walking through his men. When Stanhope suggests, you know, he, he, he have a little chat with the chaps that are going on the raid, he's, yeah. he's kind of reluctant. He's like, oh, no, they don't want to hear from me which is pretty much not what you would expect at that point in the war from a battalion commander. No. You know, they're much more hands-on. You know, they've probably been in the battalion for quite a while and gone from company level upwards yeah. with the attritional level. So, yeah, that, that's the only thing I, I thought was a, bit, a little bit off. Yeah, and, and having a, a comfy battalion headquarters. I mean, his headquarters would have been in the, in the support line uh, or, or at least in the reserve line. It would, certainly wouldn't be any further back than that. Um, and, uh, you know, people like El Elstob of the Manchesters who, who get themselves killed uh, literally fighting to the very end and, and, and wins himself a VC in the process. I mean, that, mm. that was, that was the, the, the stamp of battalion commanders of, of March 1918. And I, and I think that, that that would have been a better story. I think it would have been a more interesting story. Yeah, it's something people don't realise. Yeah. And I think the other thing, um, Journey's End, and this is a really crucial thing, because I hadn't really thought about it until we made the film. As I say, going back to 2004, we've made a, a, we helped to make a really successful West End show. We've done Broadway, we've done national tours. We've done umpteen Amdram productions of hiring out the kit to people, mm -hmm. uh, which pays the bills. And it was only when I sat down again and reread it again, um, A, 
I really got just how funny it is because there's a hell of a lot of humor. And of course, well, there's a lot of stuff in there that, that most people would think of as humor. Actually, it's irony. Um, and it's irony that would have been understood by the audience at the time, which actually most people now wouldn't get because they don't get the history. Um, and that all went back in. Uh, and I think the other thing that's important to say is that the, the, the film that Simon wrote, the script that he wrote, uh, was based more on the book because in 1930, um, uh, Sheriff and um, and Vernon Bartlett collaborated on a book based on the play, which basically sort of padded it out, gave more story, which is where you get Raleigh arriving in France and, and all that, and a lot more action uh, outside the trench. But the crucial thing, which I hadn't sussed at all until this happened, I've never heard anybody else say it either. The thing that drives the drama or drove the drama in 1928, 29, 1930, was the fact that every single person who went to see it at the cinema, who went to see it in the theatre, who read the book, knew what had happened on the 21st of March, 1918, bar none. It would, mm. it, in its day, the German March Offensive was as big a deal as the Battle of Britain a generation later or the invasion of Normandy or any of that stuff. It was huge. Yeah. And to give it a, a modern analogy, it, it's, it would be the equivalent of writing a screenplay now and setting your action in an office block in New York on the 10th of September 2001. Mm. You don't need to say what's coming because everybody in the audience knows that that's there. And that is what builds the tension, that crushing pressure. Mm. And that is what was in Journey's End in 1928. These blokes in the dugout know that this massive, massive weight, this huge, crushing German army are about to smash over the top of them. And they know, absolutely know, there's nothing they can do to stop it. That's what drove the drama in the 20s and 30s. But now, most people that go to see it don't get that. And so I was, I was sort of trying to persuade, is there any way that we could sort of show the Germans building up, but, you know, loading ammunition, you know, lo loading shell cases into limbers, anything just to give a sense of that, but they couldn't really see how it worked. But the problem with that, the problem with not having that is to a lot of people, otherwise what you end up with is a fairly slow moving film with a handful of people stuck in a dugout and there's the there's the, the the typical drunken officer who's losing it. You've got the old bloke, you've got the fat bloke, you've got the coward. Oh, and you know, and and here's the young bloke who is clearly going to get killed the minute he walks in the door. Now, in 1928, 1930, that 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 was that was cutting edge drama because nobody had written it before. Since that time, those handful of characters have been recycled through every single. Yeah piece of first world war drama that's been written in a play or in a film or in a television series so people going to see journeys in for the first time go oh, i've seen all this you know it's, there's nothing new here whereas actually if you get it if you understand mm. what it was about where that pressure came from what the the thing that drove the drama and the, and you also had to suspend everything that you've seen since and say well actually yeah this this was new in its time then it works brilliantly and of course that i think that the great thing about it was that saul did actually managed to bring that to life he he, you know, he managed to, to to work his way through the fact yeah okay so there's people that uh yeah, yeah of course we've seen these guys before but my job is to bring them to life I, I i need to make these people believable and they you know and um and they chose some great actors to actually make that happen i think it's probably one of the strongest british casts put together in, in quite some time i've got a, a list here you've got ace of butterfield as second lieutenant raleigh you've got paul bettany um as uh, lieutenant uncle osborne uh, Sam Kathleen as Captain Stanhope, Tom Sturridge as Second Lieutenant Hibbert, uh, Stephen Graham as Second Lieutenant Trotter, and Toby Jones as Private Mason. Big names, everyone. I really, I don't think you can deny. It has that same feel as those classic big ensemble films in like the 40s, 50s, you know, from British cinema, where that, you know, you've got this weight of talent that takes the raw material and projects it onto the screen in a manner that you know that the, the writers and the director is wanting. It's just got that ensemble feel of those classic films, you know, mm. innumerable to, to mention, but it, it's such a good cast. And I think the casting of, of it was, was really something. What I thought was interesting what you, that you mentioned there, Taff, was the perspective of the audience. Like when I watched it, I suppose as being a historian, I knew what the offensive was and I knew when it was going to happen. So as soon as he said 21st March, I was like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so it, you know, it could be, it could be, if you, if you go into it, it could be any trench 
from 1917 onwards, couldn't it? It's there's nothing for the general audience to go, oh, that's 1918, and that, that's something that made me think, oh, okay, so it's the tension's going to ramp. But yeah, I, I I wondered with the general audience, you know, people that aren't um, as familiar with the period as, as say we are, whether that came across the tension. But I think I think you were right, and I think Saul Dib does create that tension throughout. You know, we have mentions of it's coming in a couple of days. There's the trench raid anyway, so that mm. that kind of projects that tension, um, and that creates like a level of tension organically. So it's not an offensive, but they're going into action, and there's a, there's a build up, and and the train sort of the train noises from the distance that kind of gives something, doesn't it? A lot of people said, oh, it's, you know, obviously Sheriff has, has been wounded and gone back to, to Britain at the end of 1917. So he doesn't take part in the, the March offensive. Mm. And a lot of people say, well, why on earth did he set it then? But the reality is it, it is the only point in the entire war that you could set it. For a start, the Germans only attack the British properly yeah, a handful of times after the end of 1914, early 15. Yeah. Um, and it's the only point where you know that there is an absolutely crushing offensive coming and they know that they can't do anything about it. They've taken over a badly prepared area from the French. There, there is no second line. There is no, you know, there, there, there are aspirations for defences behind them, but nothing more. Um, mm. So it is the only point in the entire war that, that Journey's End could be set. Um, and I think it was great because, you know, 1918, you know, what, what on earth? was happening you know in 1918 yeah we know because we're interested but but from the public's point of view uh, there was 1914 and then there was 1916 and then there was some mud in 1917 and then it ended and yeah. and i think <laughs> yeah. that one of the great things was that right from the start we kept saying you must make sure that you launch it in, in march 2018 you've got to do that and, oh no 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 we're just gonna yeah we can't afford to do that the minute it's done we'll you know we, we need to screen it um but simply by luck and by uh, delays and all sorts of stuff it ends up <laughs> that's exactly what happens yeah. and um and we were lucky enough we we managed to persuade them to let us have a copy of it to screen at great war huts actually on that thursday night on the sort of the 20th 21st of march evening oh, wow. um so it's it was as, as close as you could possibly get mm. to, to the time when it was set which was which was brilliant it was it was quite a quite 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 an evening um but uh but i think that um I think for all of that, I think that it it it, it really did work. Um, you know, a lot of people say to me, "Oh, you know, it's a very slow moving thing. You get to see the play, and you almost fall asleep with it." But I, I, I and there, there, there was a danger that that could have happened. But those the characters just just keep that going. You know, there's just enough humour. There's just enough piss take. There's there's just enough jeopardy in it. There's just enough danger. Uh, all of those things keep happening. Um, and 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 they managed to keep the ball in the air all the way through. And I, I, and I think that, um, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I, we've seen some pretty dreadful amateur productions of Journey's End, which I think probably colours a lot of people's judgment towards it. But I think that um, I think if Sheriff had still been around, I think he would have been pleased to uh, to see what uh, what the. I th oh, I think so. Yeah, I, we mentioned it earlier, but that cast is 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 brilliant. Uh, Paul Bettany as as uncle is, uh, I think, perfect casting. Yeah. Yes. Butterfield at that point, relatively unknown, but quite well known yeah. now. Mm -hmm. um, really, you know, does a stand-up job, and I, and as you say, I think that um, the, the interrelationships of the men in in the bunker, in the in the dugout, rather, it comes alive. I think, and it, mm. you feel like that. That is how it would have been. You, you feel, you almost feel there at, at points. They're believable people. I think it. I think the the cast really they they mesh really well, and they feel believable. Like I feel that. Toby Jones has been with him since like 1914. He's been their cook for that long, you know. I always think Trotter's been field promoted so much, and he must have been like a, a CSM or something, yeah. Um, because just the way he wears his kit and the way that he is, he's the odd one out, but he's not the odd one out. They need him. Everyone feels real. They feel died in the wool or died in the khaki, should I say? You know. <laughs> yeah. And I, I've got a contemporary um, review from the Guardian, and I'll, I'll read a little bit for it. We, we always try to on the pod. So uh, for the 100th anniversary of the First World War's end, here is an unassumingly excellent new film of R.C. Sheriff's classic 28 stage play. Adapted by Simon Reed, directed by Saul Dibb, it's expertly cast and really well acted, forthright, powerful and heartfelt. The dramatic action is opened out while always conveying the essential cramped claustrophobia of this tragic ordeal. 
for me, I was a bit disappointed when the film came out because all these reviews were so good. And yet I asked my friends, I'm like, have you seen Journey's End? It's fantastic. <laughs> What's, what? No. Yeah, yeah. When, when, was that, when was that out? And I'm like, it's out now. Go see it. It's a British film. It's fantastic. No one went to see it. It's such a shame. I didn't see it in cinemas. I regret that. Uh, I, I just didn't know. I didn't know it was on. Well, the, the, the problem was that the, it was trying to find cinemas to screen it. Uh, as you say, I mean, the reviews, they're, they're cracking reviews one after another. I mean, the, the Times uh, the Times Sunday Review ran a, uh, a, a front cover of it saying, you know, the, uh, probably the, the, the best Great War film ever, you know, which yeah. is a hell of a claim. Um, but the problem that they had, uh, and it had been the same with, with, with Private Peaceful, in that the big multiplexes are just not interested in stuff like this, you know, it, it's all about car crashes and it's about fast action, it's about spies, all sorts of stuff. Whereas slow moving, very British historical piece, they just didn't want to know. And they just couldn't get you know, any of those big multiplexes to take it for anything more than like a couple of days. Nobody would be, no one was prepared to, to, to just say stuff it, you know, we'll just put it in, we'll just, you know, we, we've got 101 screens, we'll just put it on. And yet the BBC play it last Christmas and Twitter exploded with yeah. tweets. I think Journey Zen was trending. I think well, that's yeah, probably yeah, never yeah. happened. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it proves that it's proves that it's wanted and it and it has its place. I mean, 1917 I don't think can hold a candle to this personally for atmosphere, for actual genuine tension, not just ramped up artificial tension that was sort of in 1917. I think Journey Zen just because it's written of its time by someone who was there it has more weight and punch. We were very lucky that that we'd worked with them before, so they were prepared to take my word for it. If I said actually they wouldn't do that, their trench wouldn't look like that. You know, you, you know, 1917 is is a piece of cinema, uh, and what I mean by that is, I mean, it's you know, I, don't, I see people on Twitter saying, oh, the best thing about 1917 is I now know what my granddad's trench would have looked like when he was in the trench in 1917. Well, no, you don't, because mm -hmm. right from the start they're walking through a trench. And there's all these blokes dozing against the backside of the trench. You'd never do that because, you know, the, yeah. the, the bullets and shells, you know, they, they reach the end of the arc and they, they kill you if you're against the back. So they're always pressed against the front. And the yeah. reason that they're all squeezed against the back in 1917 is because the probably the, the, the second AD is, is looking on the monitor over the director's shoulder going, oh, there's a gap there. Right. Uh, get some blokes. Fill that gap. And that's yeah. how you make a film. But we were lucky because with Journey's End, it was right. How would it be? Well, they wouldn't be stuck against the backside of the trench ever. You know, they would always be pressed tight against the front, especially if there's any, you know, any shelling happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and they know that they would automatically do that. You, in the morning, you would sit with your back against the because nobody wants to be on the receiving end of just yep. a random yep. old stray piece of bullet or, or shell fragment. So all of that stuff, we put we whenever we do this stuff, we put all that stuff in. We just put the accuracy in as a matter of course. If the drama needs something to be inaccurate because the drama won't work otherwise, well, that's fine. Well, you know, we'll find it. We'll, we'll make it the most believable way we can. Mm. But every aspect of it, you know, we want people to be holding the rifles properly. Again, all the way through 1917, the whole lot of them, they're doing that sort of, you know, Belfast 1972. Oh, yeah. yeah. That. Just, that, Robbie yeah. was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Later on, he was. He was, but yeah. <laughs> it's a real contentious subject with me, and I hate it, right? And I never mm. knew what it was called until I became friends with Matt. Apparently it's called, is it the low carry Matt? Well, in, already, yeah. in, in, in its original form, when you come across it in the, in the uh, towards the end of the second war, they called it the stork. So it's, right. it's basically in jungle warfare, you find yourself trying to work your way around all the trees, and it's a much easier thing to manoeuvre yeah. okay. trees and then bring your rifle up. But in an age when every rifle has got a bayonet on it that's 17 inches long at least, yeah. then the idea that you'd carry it that way, you know, the minute that you run along with it, you stumble and you'll just pole vault. Yeah. But nobody would ever do that in any army. Every single army, the thing was always held upright. They would load it upright. They would unload it upright. Every single thing about it was done upright. And if, if, the, if the bullet went off, yeah, sure, it'll fly over there somewhere instead of going into the ground. But that's how it was. <laughs> well, it's it's one swift movement into the on guard, isn't it? It's just, yeah. it doesn't make sense you would carry it at the low ready. It's just... Yeah. That, yeah. that struck me as soon as I saw the trailer for 1917. I thought, oh. My, my gripe with all of this stuff, the, the people go, oh, it's only a film. I know it's only a film, but we are all paid to do the job to do it properly. So why don't you just do it properly? And it's only research. You know, five minutes on the internet will tell you yeah. how things were carried. That's all. But 
you know, with, with everything, with, when it comes to the specialist extras, we will either use guys from living history or reenactment groups who know what they're doing and are the best blokes. So it's not a case that we say actually everybody from this group or that group can all come because, mm -hmm. you know, we know that not everybody is cut out for film work. Mm. Um, and, you know, including some very good friends of mine, because a lot of them haven't got the patience for film and television work. They just haven't. And there's a lot of people who who like to sort of wear every last single piece of kit in their entire collection. Again, OK, look at the photographs, chaps. That isn't what happens. So you're not going to be in this because you will stand out like a sore thumb. We need people to blend in because that's the deal, mm. unless you're playing a specific role. So we've built up a database of two or three hundred fellas who could be called upon to make that stuff happen to bring it to life i mean things like um like private peaceful or journey's end not journey's end uh, downton abbey when you're doing the big sort of battle scenes in no man's land they will all be broken down into groups under an nco because it's the much easier way of working them out rather than do what a film company would normally do and have the third assistant director standing there at the side of the uh, of the field going you the bloke in khaki take 10 paces back and everybody <laughs> no 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 not you so we just said, right, what do you want to do? Oh, I need more blokes over there. Right, cool. So, so take your fellas 10 feet backwards. Bosh. And the whole lot's moved around like pieces on a chessboard. Mm. Because you, we just use the way that the army would have moved them around at the time because it's quicker and it's easier. And, it, and the whole thing just works much, much smoother. So we want people that know what they're doing. Uh, we've got quite a lot of fellas that have no particular interest. They don't collect the stuff. But they've come with us as, as extras for probably 10 years or more. And so they'll turn up and you go, well, there's your gear. They'll put it on properly. They know how to wear it. They know how to carry the weapons properly. And we say, right, there's an over the top scene. They will automatically all gather at the bottom of the ladders in the right order. And so it just makes life, A, easier for everybody, for us, for the crews, for, for, for the other extras. And also it just makes it more realistic more accurate because they're doing what they should be doing a lot more nuanced than having 300 yeah. guys run as fast as they can out of a yeah. recently dug trench yeah and, and i think even that i mean that to me you know by that time you know this, this is absolutely the moment when when the new training's kicking in you know by the all those lessons of the som had been learned you know that it's absolutely the time when they're, they're advancing in, <laughs> in proper formations yeah. mm. um and again, I mean, it's another reason why we, again, we 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 would rarely employ former ex-soldiers, for instance, unless they're people who have a real interest, who want to do it right, because they can't help it. They automatically just revert to what they what they do. Do what <laughs> they they've been doing, it. yeah, yeah. And it will take me several days to try and drag that out of them before mm. telling them what to do. So just using people who know nothing and then training them is usually more successful than trying to pull out of somebody years and years of experience of doing it a totally different way. So that's why we hopefully we end up with something which is as accurate as we can possibly make it. And, and as I say, the, the trick to me is that all that stuff should just be happening. It should just be invisible. It should be there so that when people are watching it, and I'll get the fact a lot of people won't know the difference, but the people that do know, they just, oh, oh, oh they got that right. And if they got that right, then they probably got other stuff right. At the same time, audience, pick up on those things that are going on and go, oh, okay, so that's what they would have been doing. Yeah. So when they watch a film that's made later or previously, or they watch something different and it's done wrong, ostensibly, then they, they you know, they go, well, that's not how the, it, was, it was in <laughs> Jenny's End or Private Peaceful. So they have like, they have something to refer to. Yeah. I think that's important. And the more accurate films are, this is one of Robbie's favorite um, points is, it's the main means of people's mass consumption. It is. Um, so that's how people learn. And it's one of the film is becoming that one of those medium that holds people's attention in an age where people's attention is taken up by a 10 second video. Film is one of those few things that can, you know, bring people into sort of a, a narrative that lasts more than 60 seconds. Mm. So I, I think it's important that all media like that is accurate. You know, it, it, that's, that's how people are consuming and trying to, you know, gather some knowledge about things and yeah. when it's a historic film it's all the more important i mean but our argument right from day one when we started this back in 2001 is that it, it just doesn't cost you any more to do it properly than it does to not do it properly Very so true. why don't you because do, if you just do it properly then somebody else could be worrying about scripts and they could be worried about all the other things but if everybody's just doing what they should be doing in the way they should be doing it and, and as i say this whole thing that you know, english people go oh it's only a film it doesn't matter well Trust me, a lot of these people are paid far more than the people who are going, oh, it doesn't matter, to, to, to get it right. 
So why shouldn't they get it right? <laughs> it just seems nuts. Giving them an easy pass seems crazy to me. I think it's really ironic as well when you see the like some some not saying not picking out any directors in particular or anyone like that, but you go, oh, we've tried to make the most authentic movie that we can, and we, we're trying to be really respectful to, to the men that gave their lives. And then you see the movies they make, and you're like, well, hang on, because if you say that and then you present like things that are wrong, then you're com- It's a complete juxtaposition, and I understand like restrictions of filming restrictions of studio all things like that but when you're sitting in front of the press and being like we've tried to make the most authentic movie that we can and then you see a guy who i don't know it's set in 1914 but he's wearing 37 pattern webbing you're like well that's just wrong and yeah. you owe it to yourself then to get it right i mean i i think that the the, the problem really it's it, it's it goes to the heart of filmmaking i mean we, we, we were very lucky with private peaceful and with journey's end they were low budget they didn't have he, they didn't have the money uh, in a way to to employ hundreds and hundreds of different people in different departments and we were very lucky that everybody had bought into the idea that they wanted to do it properly but i think that the bigger you get the bigger the scale the, the there becomes a huge distance between people like me the advisor and the directors i mean to me if i can't work with the director if i can't have a conversation like the one i'm having with you now and just say look I, I get what you're trying to do but it that wouldn't happen it should be like this yeah. And they go, oh, right, yeah, I get your point. Okay, let's just do it like that. Because 99 out of 100, they'll get, yeah, okay, I get it, let's do that. Or sometimes they'll get, look, I hear what you say, Tav, I have a very good reason for not doing that, and it's this. Or actually, I've got very good reason, I'm not going to tell you what it is, because I'm the boss. Fine. But on the really big productions, there just becomes this greater and greater distance where no one can get any, anywhere near them. Oh, no, he's, 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 he's having a moment, he's, you know, mm. he's, he's in the zone you can't talk to him you know i you know i will need to pass a message to 20 people to get to him by which point the, the moment's gone and <clears throat> you also get uh, you know different departments making their own decisions so the makeup department i've decided to to, to give them all 1980s bouffant haircuts because i think it's a creative thing to do I, I i exaggerate but that is something that can happen um, you know, the, and, and there'll be reasons for it. They will have come up with their own reason for it. I mean, the Crimson Field, the, the television series in, in uh, 2014 or 2015, whenever it was, um, the um, the, uh, the costume department uh, decided that they weren't going to have any scarlet tippets on the nurses. They were going to be crimson. Uh, they weren't going to have any red ties on, on, on blokes in hospital blue. You know, uh, so they just all got with, with open calls because it was bright and they didn't want anything bright. And I get why these decisions get made, but in the end, with all these departments making decisions that no one's got any any means of trying to pull them on board and go, look, yeah, okay, I see what you did, but okay, if they don't, if you don't want a bright red tie, put them in a crimson one because it's better than they've all got the collars open. It, it it just looks a bit mad, and the clues in the name, it's uniform, you know, they all should look the same. But that's that's what happens. So art department will go, oh, I've decided I'm going to do this, and the wardrobe are going to do that, and whereas you don't get on, on documentaries you don't get that because they haven't got the budget they, they come to us and go right just make this happen and do it properly please right and we just make it happen so I, I i see how these things happen mm. um i mean one of the other really frustrating things is that very often the art department will turn up on on or, or the production designer will turn up to see us on day one um and say right we're, we're working on something about the first world war and the first thing they'll produce is the same four or five photographs all taken within three or four days of one another in 1917 during the third battle of Ypres, of eight blokes dragging a stretcher through the mud at, mud at Pilkham and a, and a mule pulling a water cart just stuck in the mud and a, and a yeah. field gun. And, and you're like, oh, this, this is what I'm creating. Hang about, you know, you're, you're, you're doing the Battle of Mons, you know, there isn't any mud, there isn't any help. Yeah. But it's the first one. And I said, you wouldn't do this for anything else. If you were doing Call the Midwife and it was 1954, you would be researching 1954. Why aren't you researching yeah. March 1918 or February 1917? Because, and the trouble is that the imagery of the First World War, a tiny amount of it has been completely blown up out of all proportion because of the media, because they use the same stuff over and over and over and over again until it's just gone into people, even people who should know better. The thing I think I said to one of my mates in the reenactment group I used to be in, if I had a pound for every time I saw that lad with the guy over his shoulders and, <laughs> and coming up the trench in 1916 i'd like i'd be a millionaire because i've seen it so many times um but yeah talking about kit there should we move on to the alley tally chaps don't feel free it's time for alley tally on fighting on film 
Taff. So being our guest this week, um, I was going to ask you a question. Where did Trotter get his M1911? <laughs> well, again, the, the great thing with something like Journey's End is that there's nobody coming up with those character traits. There's nobody with, with the greatest will in the world. Saul's a brilliant director, but he doesn't know anything about the First World War and about British Army officers at the mm. time, apart from superficial stuff that he might have read. So I'm looking at this stuff thinking, well, actually, what have we got here? Here's Trotter. Trotter's a bit woo, he's a bit wee, he's a, you know, he's not like the others. Yeah. Let's give him something a bit different. And uh, and I've got a I've got a an original uh, M1911 Colt uh, that belonged to a, an officer of the Ninth Suffolk's. And um, so I thought, actually, uh, it, it, yeah, let, let's... Is it in uh, 455 Webley Automatic? Uh, no, the, the, the American Colt. Oh, so it's in 45 ACP. Right? Yeah, exactly that. So I think, yeah, actually, um, that's what he's going to have. So that, that was the idea, because having got a real one that belonged to a fellow who... Uh, I just loved it, because it suited him so well, because I was thinking, yeah, <laughs> Graham... If, sorry, not Graham. Yeah. Trot has been field promoted, like, in my head that he has been. Then the first pay packet he got as an officer when he got back behind the lines, had a bit of time off, he went and bought the fanciest pistol he could find, and that was it. And it just suits him so well. And it's such a blink and you'll miss it thing, but it just looks, he looks perfect for the character. And that's the thing, because obviously once they'd finally cast it, all of the cast came up to the trench. They came and had a day, all, obviously all in the civvies. And obviously we, we trained all the, the main cast members for Private Peaceful, and, the, and, and, and Simon and Guy, the producers, want us to do the same. I said, but... It's not the same. I can march them about a bit, but actually, really, this is this is much. With it, you know, they're, they're not going to do any of that stuff. Mm. You know, there'll be a tiny amount of marching. Most of that's going to be controlled by by the NCOs behind them anyway. That that great scene where they all march off out the farmyard at the beginning. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so what I really want to do, I really want to talk through with them. I want to get them at their head into 1918. I want them to understand. That what they the, the view that they've brought of the First World War with them is completely different to the war that they are about to represent on screen. So that was what we spent most of the day doing. But throughout that day, I was sort of listening to them and I was chatting with them and getting a sense of who they were and how they were likely to play those characters. And by the end of the, <laughs> by the end of that afternoon, I decided that that Trotter was going to have a, a Colt M 1911. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, when I first watched the movie and I caught that, I was I was I was very impressed. I thought that is a lovely touch mm. that almost no one else would have thought about. <laughs> a private purchase semi-automatic handgun when everyone always sort of associates associates the Webley revolver with British officers of World War One. So it's a mm. you know, it's just one of those things that are intrinsically linked. So yeah. I thought I thought it was a lovely inclusion. And for um, an, oh, can I just have one more alley tally this week, Matt? Before you go on, of course, to I'm not going to jump into mine. Sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> I just well, while, while it's in my head, the, we were talking earlier about the authenticity, and, and because you've got all the the cast and the extras that look right and proper and can act the way that they should act, it's a really, really small thing. But I, I really, really, I can see it in my head more now that we're talking to you. Rally when he puts his regular service dress jacket on to go yeah. on the trench raid. Yeah, Bethany. He's got his un top button undone. He's got the button undone of his SD. He looks comfortable. Rally's never been on a trench raid. He does it all right up to the nines with the with the collar clasps. And I was like, that is perfect. Because he's never been on a trench raid. He wouldn't know anything about it. And he's been taught at officer's school, look the part all the time, top to the dress to the nines, top button done up. And he puts it on like a prop like a proper FNG. And I just it was great. Not not particularly yeah. Ali, but I just love the inclusion. Yeah, I mean, again, it, it's always that whole thing all the time. Because I mean, as I say, th th there's no one really there that that that. It, it, and in most films, that it, that's the sort of detail that that through no fault of anyone's that it, it takes years to got that stuff in your mm -hmm. head, which is, which is what we do. So that sort of stuff, when you get right, they're going to get geared up for the trench raid. So that's the conversation, and, I, and I, I'm having that with Asa Butterfield. I said, I think that you'd do this. Oh, do you? Yeah, well, I was thinking this. I said, well, actually, you know, you've just arrived. This is what I think you do. Okay, and actually, and he's going to do, oh, right, okay, yeah. And, and he was brilliant, because he, yeah, I mean, he was one of the nicest people. Uh, he really was. And he just bought into the whole thing. Mm. Um, and there's a there's a scene where he fires a flare pistol, and, uh, and Kevin brought his, um, brought his flare pistol, his, his proper Webley flare pistol, and uh, so just said because he needed to you know, feel what it was going to feel like. What, what, what was it like to fire a flare pistol? So we're all gathered in the dark, you know, but before they shoot anything, is it right? You know, here's your chance. And, 
he, he fired about three of them just to uh, you know, just, just just to get his head around it. And the third one hit hit this enormous, hugely expensive lighting rig and uh, <laughs> really ruined that. So right, okay, that that'll be enough of that. But he was like a he was like a big well, like we would have been oh, fantastic. I'll forget that, you know? <laughs> which is nice. So Matt, your rally this week. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I I know your your pick was the Colt nineteen eleven. Mine was the Webley Flare um, pistol, um, <laughs> which is just one of those things you just don't see in films. You know, I I, I bet it isn't in more than a handful of films, mm. so it's a lovely inclusion. But my true alley pick this week is isn't isn't anything particularly um, exciting, but it's it kind of plays into that level of detail that I love about the film, and it's. The, the Princess Mary tin on the writing desk when he's writing a letter home. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that. I thought that was a really, really inclusion. And I saw your Great War, um, sorry, your, your Great War Huts video a little while ago. And you had, I think it was about four, four of them, four, four or five different, different examples. And some had the chocolate in and some had the cigarettes in. I just thought it was brilliant. And and as soon as I saw that when I was re-watching it the other day, I thought, I bet, I bet that's one of the ones that tap had out for the video. I just thought it was a really nice inclusion. Yeah, I mean, obviously th- there is an art department uh, and there are prop buyers, so there's props. Go- in fact, if I'm really honest, the only two things that niggle me, apart from uh, the, you know, the, the, the issue with the kernel that we've already gone through, is that um, there's a 1940 dated am- ammo box on the at the end of a trench in one scene, which <laughs> you know just annoys me because actually a handful of mud would have cured that. Yeah, of course, yeah. And in the officer's dugout, when they go for a meal, there's two brass... Uh, shell cases which are very clearly second world war aircraft cannon shell cases we, we've got you know pom-pom cases which would have done exactly the same job and been right but mm. again that's what happened that, that, that those things were shot in wales um so you know nobody had mentioned that they that they needed it and uh so, mm. so we went on hand to do that because um <clears throat> most of it like they, they obviously shot all the trench stuff um with us in suffolk but screen wales or welsh screen or whatever they're called sort of a welsh government had offered them money to go and mm-hmm. shoot in wales mm-hmm. uh, which was quite a powerful argument when you haven't got much money to make your film yeah um so they'd gone there and done the sort of the the the, the external headquarters stuff and they built the dugout set in a in a big um big i suppose it was a film studio or a big warehouse or something in wales um and then actually in the end the the, the money the deal fell through anyway so they would have saved a huge amount of money staying in suffolk but but that, that's just those two little bits of prop stuff which just kind of niggle mm. um but um i think uh if i may be allowed one alley thing myself right at the end after the the whole thing's been mashed to pieces um you you see the, the uh, there's a german soldier walking through the trench uh, with his mauser az carbine mm-hmm what I had in my mind with that sort of end scene, because there was a big debate about how we do it, whether it cuts off at the end of the bombardment or whether you saw the following day. Um, and I mean, it, it, I, I thought it was quite important that you showed the aftermath. And several years ago, uh, Richard Van Emden, the you know the historian, he uh, I, I called to see him in in in, in London, called, called called around to see him, and he said, I think I've just bought the the, the most amazing first world war photograph ever taken which is quite a claim yeah so i go up into his office and he said what do you think of that and it, it, incredible picture in a trench there's two dead british soldiers there's empty ammunition boxes everywhere i said I, I i completely agree with you i said would you like me to tell you when it was taken he said you can't do that i said i can i'll tell you the day he said how can you do that i said right look, look what's in it there's two two dead british soldiers one of them's wearing a great coat the British Army had an official summertime and an official wintertime. So from the 1st of October until the end of March, you could take your great coat into the trench. The minute that the 1st of March arrived, you weren't allowed, uh, sorry, the end of March, uh, after the end of March, you weren't allowed to have your great coat in the trench um, unless there was extenuating circumstances like the, the Battle of Arras when it was so cold that the boat's freezing to death. So it's going to be sometime before the end of March. Um, the, if you, you, the ammunition boxes are all empty, so it's been a fair old scrap. Um, if you look in the foreground, in the right foreground, there's a there's a rifle propped up against the side. And if you look carefully, it's a, it's a Mauser AZ carbine. <laughs> you know, there's, there are only two people, two lots of Germans who use those generally, and I'll bet it's a stormtrooper. And what's really fascinating, actually, about the one in the photograph, is that you can see the breech is open, and there's a round jammed in the breech with another one stuck in halfway behind it. So in the midst of this scrap, you like, stuff this and you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> but there's uh, there's rifles with bayonets propped up. There's blood still dripping off one of the British soldiers. There's um, distress rockets and stuff all, all, all sort of prepped. And 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 in the background, he said, "Well, it's it's smoke." I said, "It's not smoke. It's fog. It's the, it's the 21st of March, 1918, without any doubt at all." And you know, like, "Whoa!" Wow. And wow. in German script at the bottom, it was very hard to read. He, he had to get a German lady uh, to to decipher it. Basically, it said um, that the English trenches after the storm was passed. So here is a German soldier who completely gets the fact that he has just taken part in one of the most important feats of arms that the German army <laughs> had been involved in in the entire war. And he's taken a souvenir of it. Wow. And that was the image I'd got in my head. I said, that's what we need to recreate. We need to create a, a, a thing full of dead British soldiers and debris and empty ammunition boxes. Uh, and a, and a, it's been a furious scrap. You know, that's that's what we need to do. So that's what you see Jay Hendy as the German soldier walking through with the muzzle of his aid at Z carbine sort of <laughs> dragging along the ground behind him. And um, and I, I, to me, it, I, I, I do. I think they really got that. I think it really got that sense of of, of the following day. You know, the, the the fighting's moved on. It's it's probably the, the afternoon of the of, of the 21st. And uh, and um, even though, the, again, the. the you know, the, the writer and the production uh, were all of the opinion everyone gets killed I mean as we know the majority of people were captured but um, but that's just left to, to your imagination yeah. but, uh, but I think it I, I really think that um, I really think it hit the mark I think it, it, yeah. it did capture that feel that that yeah. when that when that barrage started um, you know and uh, I, I think it really got and the blokes who were in it the blokes who were sort of sort of underneath it I mean you could see you know this was some of the heaviest sort of pyros that I think mm. we've been used there for a while and it was really you know you could see them sort of getting squashed by it, it was quite impressive it's silent for a moment and then there's the most almighty thud as those mortars start landing yeah and it's it's yeah. just it yeah the, cinematically it's really beautiful because it's there's just a shot along the trench and then the the, the pyros start popping off yeah and that the, the sound is just immense really yeah. it just it it hits you so hard yeah you really feel the weight of it, especially when Rally, the the bit of is, is it a bit of corrugated iron or something that hits him in the back, a bit of d debris. But you really feel the punch of that hitting him, mm. and it's really. And I know it's coming because I know the play. But when it actually comes, you're like, oh god, yeah, that really hit him, didn't it? You know, yeah. and because I think sometimes in the play, you just you know, obviously you just see him come down from the yeah, from yeah, the little yeah. the little entrance of the dugout, and you don't actually see why he's so hurt. But seeing it, you feel for this young lad, and it's, and it's like, oh my god, it actually has real weight to it, and I, and that's another brilliant thing about the film. And again, I mean, you know, I was lucky. I mean, I interviewed quite a lot of veterans who'd, who'd remembered the, the 21st of March, and that is just how they described it. Just that, that that silence, that silence, that moment before it started, and then just a wall of sound, mm. and just, just that that crushing pressure that just pins you to the to the front of the trench. And knowing there was nothing you could do about it, you know, if you hadn't got away by then, you were you were stuffed. Yeah. Well, I think that might bring us on to our favourite scenes. Taff, as guest, uh, would you like to go first? What's your favourite scene from the film, as a film, or from your own perspective? I mean, I think. I actually think that the, the trench raid, I mean, obviously in the end, you shoot a lot more than you need. And the whole thing had been set up. There was a proper box barrage around that section of German trench, which in the end added nothing to the final story. But in order to create the, you know, to create the moment, the whole thing was done in real time. So they'd all been briefed. They knew what they were doing. Um, they'd got a few actors in, in amongst them and quite a lot of, uh, of my fellas who really knew what they were doing. Um, and obviously Paul Bettany and Acer, and they, they, they'd they all sort of wriggled their way out into a sap just in the leather jerkins yeah, of the rifles. Yeah. Um, that sap, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and at whatever the, the queue was, suddenly the, the trench mortars start laying down this box barrage around this piece of German trench, at which point the signal to go, and they all go dashing across in this great, in this great rush. Um, and as they sort of break it, there's a corner of the German trench which has been smashed in uh, and Pickles Hayward, one of the khaki chums, he's uh, just, nobody's briefed him to do it, but a German pops up at the end of the trench and he just goes to shoot him and that, that's the sort of the lead in that gets them into the trench. There's a sort of furious piece of action. They, they grab a German prisoner, they haul him out. 
And my memory of it, and it might only be a memory of it, is that that was just the sort of like the first take they were just going to you know see how it went and then do it properly right. um and i can just remember laurie rose the cameraman saying that's perfect we, we don't need anymore that, that's it we, we got it you know we, <laughs> they've just done what we need them to do um and obviously they sort of haul the german out then the stuff where bettany gets killed and uh yeah it was it was quite surreal it all just happened in real time there wasn't like 101 different versions of it they you know it, mm. it, it, it just sort of happened in real time and i think that that pretty much summed up again it, 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 that, that they created it exactly how i said it needed to be done well this is how i've read it this is how the you know at the time this is how it was done um right okay we'll go for it and we obviously we got some of our fellows who really knew what they were doing who sort of led the action and took them into it um and actors good actors being good actors they, they do as they're told and <laughs> they just brought it brought it all to life it's really nicely shot it's it's tight you know you you get that feeling of chaos and it's you know it feels kinetic and you you feel like it's this dash and they're stumbling and, you know, there's mortars going off, there's smoke coming in. Mm. And then, you know, they, they grab that that German guy and he's reluctant to get out of the trench. You know, sometimes you might think an actor, would, you know, possibly help, you know, scramble up the side or, you know, be dumped into the, the British trench. But he's literally just, he is properly manhandled in that scene. Mm. I, I think he was terrified. I think, because I mean... <laughs> He, he hadn't really, be, he'd been told there was going to be a trench train. He was going to be taken prisoner, but right. we'd deliberately not given him any other direction. So he got no idea what to do other than just do what he thought he would do in that situation, which was just actually was be terrified because all these blokes with guns have suddenly popped up. They've just killed three of your friends around you. And and and, and actually no one knew who was going to be grabbed either from memory. I think there was like three or four. So it was just, you know, <laughs> and he just got grabbed. And and uh, and actually it, it was an awkward thing to get because it, it, it's the full depth trench and there was a bit smashed in the side with, yeah. with jagged bits of wood everywhere. And uh yeah, he was just he was just hauled out and manhandled. <laughs> That's really nice. And obviously, you get to see the the difference in the two trenches as well with the the way that the Germans built. Obviously, you've got the both. You've got the usage of, of both sort of trenches. So it's nice from a um, a point of view of a, of a movie goer that oh, okay. So in that little tiny little sequence there, that trench did look different. Yeah. So at least going away from it, someone will be like, oh, okay, so the trenches were different. So it's another yeah. layer on top as well. Yeah, I mean, when we built it, I mean, we built the, we'd already got the British trenches, which we'd uh, we'd built, uh, well, I don't know, two thousand and two, something like that. And in two thousand and five, we we made Song from Defeat to Victory for the BBC, which was their ninetieth anniversary um, production for the for the Song anniversary. And the decision then was to deliberately make. I mean, at, at different times, the both sides used the same materials for, for for the same reason. But we thought if we made the German trench specifically look different then you go oh we're back in the German oh now we're in the British trench so it would give you mm -hmm. a clear visual um in the end they did use the British trench in the end as well uh, sorry the German trench they did redress they put corrugated tin in it the the famous scene where Sam Claflin comes out in the middle of the barrage sort of looks one way and then slowly looks the other way and there's all this sort of you know corruption going on around him yeah uh, that, was, that was done in the German trench um just because uh, that, that was the the dugout that they preferred to use, so so we we put some corrugated tin in just to just mm. to give you a sense that it, it wasn't that German trench mm. anymore. And in fact, actually, they uh, when they did the uh, the when they when they did the trench raid, when they grabbed the German, they'd actually filled the dugout entrance in. They'd made a sort of a blank to go over the dugout doorway, and they'd got a block which filled the <laughs> filled the gap in the in the fire step, so you wouldn't have known there was a dugout there. So. How much trench do you actually have? What what kind of length? length? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it covers uh, the whole site covers a few acres. Um, mm. I've I've never bothered sort of working it out really, but the, sometimes people come. And say, oh well, there's not that much of it. But by the time you've filled it full of blokes, two hundred men won't fill it. Mm. You know, we, we, when we I think again we did some from defeat to victory. Um, the attack across no man's land. Uh, the BBC locked the camera off right behind the trenches. We, there were some shattered tree stumps and all that through the edge of Tiatmar Wood. And we had 200 fellas and we moved them sort of four times or moved them three times. So you ended up with sort of a, an entire battalion, 800 fellas sort of going up the hillside. And even then they, they didn't fill the landscape. I mean, it, it really gives you a sense of just how many men there, there would have been in, in these attacks, you know, because you, you can have the most enormous trench system on the planet but unless you've got enough people to fill it so so um but we've got the yeah you know, i mean the british trench there's a section of front line there's a bit of support line there's communication trench there's an assembly trench um 
then uh, then at the top of the hill there's a uh, you know, German trench in sort of still in fairly good order then a piece that's smashed to pieces and a short bit leading mm -hmm. to some brick rubble so it's it's flexible enough to shoot most things that you would need to to film trench wise uh, and it gets used for all sorts it gets used for first war second war modern um sci-fi vogue magazine have been done a shoot there i mean you, you never know who's turning up next <laughs> british bake-off <laughs> it's interesting because robbie and i were, were, were talking about um world war one movies in general and we were we, you know we were saying it's rare that you actually see an actual battle depicted you see the life in the trench and that's what everyone associates with world war one there's very few modern attempts to sort of tell the story of how a battle you know might have looked so we don't really see what what it would have looked like for these men going across no man's land yeah i mean the, the, generally speaking the issue is that it, it's it's an expensive thing to do you know mm. it's a costly exercise it's, mm. uh, it's hard to choreograph uh, i mean the, the the two that spring to mind really uh, are private peaceful the uh, the attack scene in peaceful i thought was was brilliant in fact i still think it's one of the best um pieces of first yeah. war combat um, not least because it's it's unexpected because they they, they they advance across no man's land without fixed bayonets and then exactly as per the book they get a couple hundred yards from the German line stop kneel down fix bayonets and then charge the last bit with lots of aggression which is which is pretty much what the training was in 1915 um, right. so uh, which again caught lots of people out go, why yeah. on earth do they do that oh, yeah. well, because that's what they were trained to do and I think that what was lovely about that was that the way that I mean, the cameraman was a Polish fellow called Jersey, and the way that Jersey had shot that was um, was it was just very matter of fact. So you're, you're going across no man's land, all the stuff's going on, and when one of the main characters who you've been with all the way through the film, when he gets shot and killed, you see him get shot, and as you go past, you, you just look down, and then it's on. There's none of that sort of slow, lingering, watch like get out of his eyes stuff, and then move on. It, it, it's just as the old boy said, you know, you'd saw your mate, your mate get killed, you, you couldn't stop. And you never saw him again. Cool. Bang, gone. You know, and, and keep moving. And I think that that really, really put that across far better than than most of the sort of the big budget productions that you see. Again, because most big budget productions don't actually research how those how those scraps were fought. You know, the, the fights of the time were, you know, were were were, were, were always choreographed, if you like, in, in very specific ways, depending on what part of the war. Um, I mean the uh, the other one that that springs to mind, which um, which is my favourite, and I bang on about this endlessly just because it was a, a great thing to be able to do, um, to actually have a direct impact on on the end result, um, was in Downton Abbey, the the second series of Downton Abbey. Uh, they'd had a scene earlier on, which was meant to be the song where they you know they get beaten back. The final scene where where Matthew Crawley gets injured. Was it was in 1918, which was good because I was, this is great. You know, you're, you're touching on something that most people don't know about. And Julian Fellows had picked some obscure action somewhere. And I said, look, can we just alter that and make it the 8th of August 1918, the Black Day of the German Army, to make the point that, OK, if Crawley's going to get injured, at least make it a day when nobody could argue that it wasn't worthwhile, that, that you know, this wasn't futile. This was the day where they really achieved something and that your sacrifice was worth it. And they went, yeah, yeah, let's do that. OK. Great. Okay, that's fine. So we we we'd spent all morning doing the, the, the literally the over the top bit, the getting up out of the trench and, and the first bit of the advance. Then they broke for lunch, and we'd got about I don't know 25, 30 Germans, mostly reenactors, some local fellas. Um, and just as they broke for lunch, I, I heard the director say to the third AD, "Get rid of the Germans. I don't need the Germans. We'll send them home." And uh, so I wandered over to her and I said, did he, did he just say, send the German home? She said, oh, yeah, we don't need it. I said, look, can you just do me a favour? If you send them home, it'll be a real problem because nobody minds hitting the cutting room floor. They just don't. They expect that. That's what films are all about. But if you've taken a day off work and you've come to the other end of the country, as some of these fellas have, and you don't even get used, next time I ask them, they're just going to say no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. That's fair enough. Yeah, fine. So... <clears throat> She said, well, just leave me in the trench. I said, right, brilliant, okay. As soon as she'd disappeared, I went and saw the armourers, and I said, I want you to do me a favour. I want you to issue every single German a Mauser rifle and 20 rounds of ammunition. Oh, yeah, but the director's just, yeah, I know. I've heard what he said. This will be on me. If it all goes horribly wrong, it'll be my fault. But I want you to give all of them 20 rounds of ammunition and a Mauser. 
And they went, so what are you going to do? And I explained what I was going to do. Right, OK, can you put, kit us out with some uniforms? Hey, why is that? He said, we'll get the Maxim out. <laughs> they dragged the, <laughs> the MG08 on its sled out. And we got them togged up over lunchtime. And I went to the, all the Germans and said, right, this is what's going to happen. You are not to tell anybody. Nobody's to know this. No member of the crew. Nobody. No, none of the Brits. After lunch, you get back there early. You get those rifles. You get in your trench. And what's going to happen is that when the Brits do their attack, as they're advancing, there's a track that runs right up through the centre of no man's land. When the first blokes get on your side of the track, just let them have it. And we'll rely on the fact that the Brits will do what, that they'll just they'll realise what's happening and the first wave will get killed and then they're going to keep coming. They're going to keep coming because it's the 8th of August. They're going to break over the top of you. Some of you need to get killed. Some of you need to surrender and some of you need to run off. And the guys from the German reenactment group are, we're not going to surrender, we're going to get killed. <laughs> Fill your boots. Anyway, <laughs> so... It's been a, you know, it's been a nice late lunch. Everyone's had too much to, to eat and they're all a bit lethargic. So eventually they uh, finally, right, OK, camera's rolling. The camera's on a, on a dolly. It's sort of running along this track along the side. And um, they said, right, OK, up you get. So they all come charging out of the trench. They all sort of form up into their lines. And as they start sort of, you know, gathering speed as they're crossing no man's land, the first few blokes get to the road and suddenly it just explodes the German front line explodes in this hail of fire machine gun fire and the first but you see the expression on their face of complete surprise as they get killed and first first few fellas all get killed or wounded and they're rolling around and I'm sort of being amongst them I say keep going yeah don't stop so the the NCOs are dragging them on and there's German soldiers surrendering and being pulled up you know by the by the shoulder straps and there's others being killed and surrendering and and it's just like this tide that just goes over the top of the trench and out the other side and in the midst of all this I can just hear the director go get the camera off the dolly get in amongst them shoot it as a documentary this is fantastic. <laughs> and it was brilliant because in the end, in the final scene, when you see Crawley gets hit, there's a, you know, he's, he, he, there's a huge shell coming and his Batman pushes him out of the way and this big bang and all that. But you see this big tide swarm over the top mm. of the German trenches. And the last thing you see is Germans surrendering and, uh, you know, mm. and it really, really worked. If I'd have said, can we do this? He'd have said no. Uh, but it's one of those times if you won't very often get away with it where you can actually influence it and you know that you're going to end up with something much better at the end of it. And, uh, and, and the, the ends justify the means. It was, a, it was a great piece of filmmaking. And more importantly, to, from my point of view, it absolutely made the point that, that the attack on the 8th of August was, was a success. <laughs> I think my favourite scene um, is the, the sequence where Graham uh, as Trotter is showing uh, Asa Butterfield's character around the trench. You know, he's arrived and he sort of takes him under his wing and he walks him along the trench and shows him where everything is. And then he comes to the Lewis gun and he, you know, ah, Lewis. And he, you know, he, he shoulders the Lewis on its, on its uh, mount and he's looking over no man's land. He starts making shooting noises <laughs> and it cuts to Graham and he has like this wry, sort of like grin on his face, you know, and he's looking at the men. It's just like really interesting, lovely little moment of, you know, a bit of humour. Mm. Bit of uh, bit of humanity, and uh, you know, it's just, it's just a very uh, it's 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 a scene that sets up the trench. It shows you the trench, but it it does it in such a way that it raises up Trotter the character, and you know, gives a little bit of life to the to the to the people at Butterfield's characters meeting. I just think it's a really lovely scene. It's like the I always think that that Trotter is like fathering him because when it, when they're going out, it's like right where you. Wear your gas mask back under your chin like a serviette, and he's taking him around, show, like you know, introducing him to all all the the Tommies and stuff. And it just feels like like a father smiling at his son when he does get killed later on. It, it it's even more weight to like, oh god, you know, like he was their second lieutenant, but he was also like their son because they saw youth in him. It is. It's one of my favorite. What about you, Robbie? What's your what's your favorite scene from the film? Well, I think I had mentioned it earlier. It's when Osborne and um and Rally are um are gearing up for the trench raid. And it's just, it's the dialogue for me that, that really sells it. Osborne's trying to calm him down because he keeps going on about, like, will the Germans retaliate? And, and Osborne's like, of course they will. There's a poem by Lewis Carroll, Walrus and the Carpenter. And I've just got a little bit of extract from the script. So Osborne says, the time has come, the war has said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings. Riley replies, and when the sea is boiling hot and the pigs have wings, now we're off. Quick, let's talk about pigs. Black pigs or white pigs? And then Raleigh goes, black pigs in the new forest. And they start talking about home and Raleigh sort of going on these big walks and he invites Osborne. And it's while they're gearing up and Osborne's taking all these things off. And I just, I really like it because one, I've said before, you know, they're, they're fathering Raleigh, but it just shows how 
Osborne is sort of, he knows exactly what's going to happen and he knows what can happen and he just doesn't want to think about it. And he's timing it. So he's like eight minutes time for a small pipe. And he does, he has a little bit of his pipe and he goes, oh, I hate to leave it with a glow on it. And then they have to leave. And I just, I just love it. It's such a lovely little character piece completely ripped from the stage play. I don't think there's much dialogue changes at all, but I just, I just love that scene. I just think it's so personable. It's a great scene. It really is. And it, it's one of the, it's, it's one of the scenes that is so human. Bettany just, he's, he's a phenomenal actor. Mm. And I think in that film, he's just, he's as good as he, he ever has been on screen. He's yeah. it, that's that performance is up there for me with his performance in Master and Commander. Okay. I think it's probably more accessible because it's, you know, the dialogue is a little bit more modern, mm. but I think, I think his acting is just so on point in that scene. It's, he's just such a likable character in, in that, in that moment. When you get why they call him uncle then. I mm. think that's when you realize why he got that nickname. Cause he, he just, just feel like a lovely uncle. You're like, okay, I'll go on a trench raid with you. Come on. <laughs> the weight of his death really hit Stanhope after mm. that scene. And he's like, look, he's the only man that I could trust. He's the only man that knew how it felt to be here. The strength of the script more than anything really comes through then, really, you know, the brilliance of, of, of Sheriff's writing there. That's just for me, like why I love it so much. It's just the words and the, the way that it's delivered by Bethany and Acer. But this is, this is it for me. This is the only version that I enjoy now. There can't be many plays from 1928 that uh, that, that still resonate like that. There, there, of course, there are some brilliant plays that still doing the rounds, but certainly I can't think of another uh, another play about the war that, uh, mm. that 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 still works on all those levels. The detail's still accurate. The, it sums up the era, you, the personalities, the people, the relationships. The you know, and as I say, you know, if you know about. The, what happens on the 21st of March, if you've got all that as well, then, then then every single bit of it still works. I don't think there's any of it really that, that doesn't. And, the, and as I say, the only thing really is that there's quite a lot of the stuff that, that people see now as humour, which at the time were irony, which, which if you don't know, <laughs> if you're not in, in with the in-joke, you don't get the irony, but you still see that it's humour. Um, and it still works. And I, and I think that... Uh, it, it, it would have been possible to make a version of it and completely screw that up, but yeah. I'm very pleased to, to say that we worked on a production that didn't. I think it's, a, it's an absolute triumph. A lot of the questions I was going to ask you, Taff, yeah. have basically you've you've answered in you know just basically telling us. So I, I I did have a couple of questions I was going to just ask about general things about you know the job. Yeah. Um, but you know you've touched on them while you were describing working on the various productions, so. I don't know whether you had anything, Robbie, you wanted to do before we do final thoughts. Um, the only thing I wanted to ask was, um, I think you did answer it, but did you have to put any of the actors through any sort of basic training or anything like that? Were any a bit hard to sort of get into the mindset, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, not so much with this. I mean, we, we, generally speaking, we would do that. I mean, we certainly did with Private Peaceful and others, but because really here, there, there wasn't a need for most of that. Um, you know, we, 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 you know, we had an afternoon marching around and, and, and answering questions. We did some weapons handling. Um, but again, the great thing with actors is that if they're good actors, you tell them and they just do as they're told. Of course. Um, and you and normally they'll get it very, very quickly. And once they've got it in the mind, oh, you want it done like this? Right, I'll do it like that. And, and then after that, then there's never a time when they're carrying the weapons wrong. Or, you know, so, so, I mean, that, that's from that point of view. Um, so no, I, I mean, apart from a, 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 a brief introduction to it, and obviously, you know, we were there all the time. So if, sure. if there was any questions they'd got that they needed answering, we could do that. And uh, and obviously, Khaki Devil, Kev Smith, my business partner, um, he's there all the way throughout as well. Because I mean, Kev, there's nothing Kev can't make. So you know, if you need a uh, if you need a Maxim gun knocked up in a couple of days or something like that, or a, or a particular grenade, um, mm -hmm. he, he's got that knowledge as well. There's nothing that he can't make. So so if there was anything specific, then all of that stuff was happening, you know, in the background. Um, yeah, and it was proper teamwork, you know, it was, uh, you know, the, the whole thing, it just, and, and again, because of the way that we employ the specialist extras, we, we employ some of them, we pay them a bit more money to effectively be the NCOs and say, right, you are in charge of these 10 fellas. Um, and so to help the costume department say, well, you don't need to worry about this. These guys are going to be responsible for themselves. So after every tea break or every meal break, 
they just check each other. So there's never a time where suddenly the you know there's a Sam Brown on the backwards or there's a, a small box respirator swinging around the knees or a small box respirator worn backwards, which is a cardinal sin, as you well know. Um, so all of those things are, are taken care of internally, um, which means that the you know the costume department could just concentrate on the main cast members and and make sure that they were always exactly as they should be. And again, even then sometimes you work with departments where they're really precious and they don't like being told but but there was none of that you know Anusha the costume designer we'd worked with her on Private Peaceful um and so she was more than happy for, for if I'd turn up and said actually you know that needs to turn around or that's the wrong way up or that needs sorting out or you'd never wear it like that none of that was a problem always happy to to do that um and of course the other problem that you get with film is that the costume department say no no I'm responsible for costume the prop department are responsible for the equipment that they wear and to us, that's a nonsense because that isn't how soldiers are. Soldiers wear this stuff all the time. It's them. It's part of their thing. So our whole argument about this is that that, that equipment has to be part of the the, the outfit, if you like, um, because it needs to. Look, they need to look like people who wear it every day of their lives and are comfortable in it. Whereas. You, know, you you watch so many films and it's so clear that, that the costume department have put the, the uniform on them and somebody else has then hung a set of random equipment on that doesn't really fit and is all loose and baggy. Yeah. So it, it's it, it's all of that sort of stuff that we go out of our way to make sure that, that the people that we're supplying you with or the people we're helping you with look and act like the soldiers of whatever the period is. You know, that's that's the deal. That's what we do. We, we try and make it as, as real as we possibly can so that all the actors need to concentrate on is the lines and, and bringing it to life. Of course, I think you do a fantastic job. <laughs> what can you say? So, Matt, any any final thoughts for Journey's End this week? I know it's been a bit of a bit of a different episode, everyone. But <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, we really wanted to we really wanted to have someone on who's worked it on films. For me, it's just it's a really um, it's an important film. I think I think it's beautifully shot. There's a great cast, and it's authentic. It feels mm-hmm. authentic. It looks authentic. Um, the dialogue is authentic, obviously, because Sheriff wrote it all the way, you know, back then in 1928, and he was there. So it it just has that feel of authenticity that I think is really important. And, you know, I think it's probably got the best um, attention to detail of, of almost any World War One film that's been made in the last 15 years. Um, and I, I, I just, it's just an excellent film. I really enjoyed mm-hmm. it. I've watched it a number of times now, and I've always thought, it was, you know, it's it's up there in portrayals of World War One yeah. for me. It's real. It's just a great movie. Yeah, I mean, I definitely any listeners who haven't seen it, please seek it out. Um, I think it's on one of the big streaming services at the moment or DVD. But it's just it's one of those works that I think if you haven't seen it in one guys, or if you haven't seen it on a stage, if you haven't seen it on TV, just seek this one out because it's it's a special film. It really is, and I think it's it's probably up there with some of the best war or films about war. Um, ever made really i think i mean it's interesting because the the producers guy and simon um the, the, in a way they they kind of never see their films as war films despite the fact they've made private peaceful and, and journey's end mm-hmm. um they uh the, i mean they they the, in some of the interviews they gave they were sort of seeing it as a sort of a uh, almost as a sort of a, an analogy of the modern world we live in they were comparing it to the to, to, to the modern wars in iraq and afghanistan i mean i Personally, I don't get that. I don't see that. I don't understand that. I don't. Uh, I, I think that. I, I think that they kind of under, undersell what the, what they've achieved, which is a, a superb version of, of um, of, a, of a great war film. Uh, which and of course the, the other problem is that both of them are very very anti-war. They you know they they both believe this sort of the old school version of uh, of, of Hague's butchers and bunglers and uh, mm. lions led by donkeys and all that. Mm. Because to be honest, most people who work in the film and television industry do believe that. Um, and it's a shame because, of course, the, the absolute irony, the real irony, is that a century ago, they would have been the people in charge. You know, the, the people that make film and television, the very well-educated, the, the wealthy, the, the, you know, the, the, the guys from the sort of upper middle class, you know, mm. upper class backgrounds, would have been those people that they very often now decry. And, uh, and I always think there's a real irony in that. And, and it's very, very difficult shaking them from that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we, I've worked with no end of directors that are absolutely adamant that, that historians are, you know, they only come up with different versions just to sell books, not actually, you know, in recent times, the information's now available 
uh, and it's possible to see that actually <laughs> you're wrong <laughs> you know and uh, yeah it's difficult for people to understand that historical discourse flows and moves and changes yeah. with yeah. you know interpretation and digging it's yeah. just something difficult for people to to grasp because it isn't an everyday sort of thing but but i think that the joy with journey's end is that you don't need to to believe one thing or another you know sheriff made a, he wrote a snapshot in time uh, of a world that he'd been part of yeah. and what they what they brought to life in in 2017 and uh, and, and and screened literally 100 years almost to the day since uh, since, since the action happened was that snapshot they they brought that to life in the form in a form that sheriff would have recognized and so would everybody else who was there and i think that uh, that that's the real achievement of, of journey's end thanks so much for joining us taff i i i've been super excited to have you on and, and talk about you know the realities of making a, a war movie so it's really special to have you join us so thank you so much it's been a pleasure it's been an absolute pleasure <laughs> thank you both very much no problem and everyone listening don't forget to give us a like a subscription a written review on whatever you're listening to we love to read them don't forget to follow us on the twitter at fighting on film and we'll catch you in the next one cheerio